Throughout the Bible, Israel is often referred to as God's chosen people. So the question is, why are they rejecting Christ? Well, I want to give you the main reason, the true reasons for why the Jews reject Christ as their Messiah. When we consider the promises that God has made to Abraham, remember, God makes a covenant with Abraham and notice what he says in there. He says, I will make you a great nation, chapter 12, verse 2 of Genesis, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so here we see God making a covenant with Abraham or in this case, Abram, and that his descendants will be blessed. They will be a great nation, which naturally means that there'll be people, a land. And the interesting thing is that the promises that God has made to Abraham as well as his descendants have not been fully realized. So is it that God's promise is going to be nullified? Has he changed his mind? Well, none of that is the case. He is going to fulfill his word. And even in that, built into that, though we don't see it at the time, is even Israel's rejection and ultimately their acceptance of their Messiah. Israel is and always has been a proud nation. And because of the promises that God has made with them and for them, the natural expectation is, God, when are you going to restore the kingdom or bring the kingdom to Israel? As a matter of fact, even the apostles, as Jesus is meeting them before he departs for his ascension, they ask him the very same question in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They said, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So even they were anticipating and wondering, Lord, when are you going to bring the kingdom to Israel? The problem is, by and large, Israel is rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. As a matter of fact, it's one of the concerns that Paul brings up, and we'll deal with that in just a little bit. But the problem is, Israel is not accepting Christ as their Messiah. The question is, why? A lot of this stems from when Israel made God jealous because they went after other gods. And so God makes the statement in Deuteronomy 32, starting verse 21, it says, They have made me jealous with what is not a God. And his response is, they have provoked me to anger with their idols, so I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I'll provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Well, this foolish nation and those people who are not a people are the Gentiles. And that is how God is going to, one, bring in the Gentiles, but also bring the Jews back to him. So notice what God is saying. He's saying what he will do and then what they will do. He will put their, or his laws, in their heart other passages tell us that he will put his spirit in their heart and they will not reject him. They will walk with him. They will not turn away from his statutes or his teachings. They will be his people and he will be their God. The reason why that's important is because at some point in time, though Israel has rejected him now, they will not at some point in the future. Also remember that he has not neglected or will never cease to have Israel as a nation before him. That's important. Notice what he says in chapter 31, staying there in verse 35, says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that his waves roar, the Lord of the host is his name. If this fixed order does not depart, which we have not seen it depart yet from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So the point is that since we still have the stars, we still have the moon, we still have the suns, we still have the waves, as long as they haven't departed, then neither will Israel ever cease to be a nation before the Lord. They will be a nation before the Lord. The problem is they have not been a devoted nation to him right now. Why have they turned their back on the Lord? Well, here's the primary reason why. It goes back to their pride as a nation. And that's the problem. Their pride is in their heritage, in their nationality, in their culture, rather than in God. That's the point. Jesus is unlike them. Jesus is humble. Jesus cares for the other people. Jesus deals with people who are not Jews. The Jews don't like that. And so because of that, the Jews have always plotted, especially their leaders have plotted to kill Jesus. Now, this has been prophesied as well. And Jesus even makes this statement. The statement is also made in Matthew 27 verse 18, for he knew that because of envy, jealousy, that they had handed him over. So Jesus was aware, obviously, that the Jews, especially the Pharisees, did not like what he was doing. He was basically upsetting the apple cart. And for that reason, that was one of the main reasons why they did not like him. Jesus spoke harshly of their hypocritical ways and how they would defile the word of God and not use it fairly. 
And notice what he says. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Well, one, him making that statement was a problem for them because who does this person think he is? That's going to be another sticking point for the Jews. But he says, verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. That includes him dealing with Israel. Now, something else that he says immediately after that is in verse 20. And this is the problem for the Jews because their, their heritage, their pride, their nationality was a source of their, at least in their eyes, perceived righteousness. And what does Jesus say? He says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. They thought highly of themselves when there was no need to. There was no reason to. What they should have put their faith and their trust in was in God Almighty. They didn't do that. And one of the greatest reasons why they did not like him personally was because he, Jesus, claimed to be God. He would make statements. He says that I'm the I am. And unless you believe that I am he, then you will die in your sins. Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews didn't like that. The Jews wanted to kill him as a result of that. Jesus asked them, why, which of these good things that I do, or what is it I say that makes you want to kill me? They said, not for any good works that you've done, but because you, a man, call yourself or make yourself out to be God. And so they obviously they had an issue with it. They thought that Jesus was a blasphemous heretic, someone who has come to destroy the law. Jesus said again, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And Paul tells in Romans 10 that Jesus is the end of the law. Well, what does the law require? The law requires that, it, that there be this sacrifice to atone for sins. And so Jesus would put himself squarely as the person who, who would atone for sins. They did not like that. They didn't like the fact that he would even say that he could forgive sins. Thankfully for Israel, even though they have not been faithful, God is faithful. God is faithful to his word and what he said he is going to do, going back from the old to the new. And one of the greatest reasons for Israel turning their back on God is so that us as Gentiles will also be brought in. Keeping in mind that God has said that he is going to make a people who are not a people and a nation, a foolish nation, use them to make Israel jealous. Notice what he says in Romans 11, 8. He says, just as it is written, God gave them who? Israel, the Jews, a spirit of stupor, eyes to see and not ears to hear. And so God has brought about this spirit that has caused them to not understand. Why is that? We're going to get to that. But notice what he also says in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. He says, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be unwise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. And look at the reason why, or at least when, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. Now, what does this mean that all Israel will be saved? Does it mean that everyone who's a Jew will be saved? No. All of those who are Israel, who are nationally, ethnically of Israel, they who will, they will be saved, at least those who have placed their faith in Christ. That is, according to God, who the true Jews are. Going back to Romans 11, 11, he says, I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. And that is Israel. They didn't stumble so as to fall. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Remember, God has stated he's going to make them jealous with the Gentiles. Now, Paul stated earlier that this is a mystery. And notice what he says in Colossians 1.25. He says that of this church, that is those who have placed their faith in Christ, we are now part of the church. I was made a minister according to the stewardship of God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Notice what he says. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifest to the saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope and glory. And the truth is they should have picked up on it because the name Abraham is a father of nations, plural, which meant that there was naturally going to be more than just the Jews. But this mystery, this this thing that, that the Jews did not quite get is now being fulfilled, that God has also brought about salvation to the Gentiles. Remember when the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles in Acts 10, the Jews marveled that even the Holy Spirit is now upon them. Why? Because the Jews were a proud people and sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes a bit prejudicial at that time. They only thought that the riches of God, the revelations of God and so forth was only for them. 
But God has made known, as Paul says, that this mystery has always been that God has always had a plan, not just for Israel, but for the Gentiles as well. It's just that with the Jews, God was giving us an example of either how to follow or in many cases, how not to follow. But God is using the Gentiles to bring about his plan to bring the Jews in. And that brings us to why the Jews have rejected Christ, because as he said, they've been given this partial hardening. Why? So that the Jews would see the Gentiles coming in. This partial hardening would be taken away when the fullness of the Gentiles in. And then God will start dealing, according to Jeremiah 31, he'll start dealing with the Jews. And how will he do so? In the same way that he's dealt with the Gentiles, by regenerating their hearts, giving them the mechanism internally, the spirit, to cause them to keep believing and to keep following his word. Now, if you notice in Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul has a concern for Israel, and we mean the nation of Israel, because they are not accepting Christ, which is the point of this video, why the Jews have rejected him. And he wants to be known that it's not going to be so forever. Notice what he says in Romans 10, 14, because if they have rejected him, well, then how will they come back? And this is what Paul's addressing. He says, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Even though this passage has been and can be used for anyone who doesn't know the Lord, it can be used evangelistically. In particular, though, it's referring to Israel. The they is they. How will how then will they the Jews or Israel call on him in whom they have not believed. How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. This is where the Gentiles come in. The Gentiles will be the ones who will preach the gospel. And we see this now preaching the gospel to the Jews. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of Christ. And notice when we say the word hearing, it's not the verb hearing, but it is the noun, akoe, which is a report. Most of what you're going to see Paul referring to or harkening back to is going to be prophecies from Isaiah. We're going to go there in a second as to what God is going to do with Israel and how these prophecies in Isaiah ver verify this out. But he says, so faith comes by hearing by the report, which we get from Isaiah, whose report shall they believe? They've not believed our report. Notice what he says in verse 16. But I say, surely, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Who's the they? That is Israel. Israel has heard the gospel, but he says their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And so here we are coming full circle to why they have been rejecting God. Because now, because God has given them this partial hardening, this spirit of stupor, and at some point in time, while they're being made jealous, the Gentiles are going to be the very tool, those that have made them jealous, be the very ones to bring them, to give them the gospel. He says in verse 20, Isaiah was very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. That is us, Gentiles. But as for Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched my hands to an out to a disobedient people and obstinate people. But the question is, is their rejection complete? Is God through with Israel? Notice what he says in chapter 11, verse one. He says, God has not rejected his people, has he? which we spoke of. And clearly there are some Jews that have placed their faith in Christ. Paul, for one, other Jews, the first Christians in the Bible were Jews. And even to this day, we've got some Jews that are placing their faith in Christ. But the overwhelming reason why this not happened, because God has placed a spirit of stupor, a partial hardening on Israel. It's not a complete hardening. Again, some Jews are coming in. What is going to happen when the time comes, God is going to work with Israel. God is going to fulfill his promise. And one of the promises is that Israel is going to, by and large, as a nation, they are going to say some words. What are the words? Well, the words that Isaiah gives in 53, these are prophetic words of what Israel is going to say. Now, although we as Gentiles may also say these words, these are prophetic about Israel, which is why they are spoken, the verbs are, in past tense. But God is going to affect the hearts of Israel, and they will say these words. They will say what Paul says they will in verse 1, chapter 53, 
who has believed our message or our report, what Paul said in chapter 10 of Romans, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted. Look what it says. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and like one whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Notice he's using past tense verb. Why? Because Israel is going to say this in the future about what happened to Jesus. Notice what it says. Surely our griefs he himself bore, past tense, and our sorrows he carried. We ourselves did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities, past tense words. The, chast the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, guess what, guys? We are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The iniquity of Israel to fall upon him. And at some point in time in the future, Israel, because of God's work in their heart, is going to turn their hearts to him. In the meantime, why have they turned their backs on God? One, it was prophesied that they would do so. Israel as a nation will have turned their back on their Messiah even to this day. But at some point in time in the future, they'll repeat the words of Isaiah. And then we'll have one flock made up of Jews and Gentiles led by one shepherd. And so ultimately, why has Israel turned their back on God? Well, it's all part of a plan that God has designed to bring in Jews and Gentiles to make one nation out of many people. Amen.